On Christmas Eve, December 2019, Kevin, who had been on Grinder, left his home after work to meet a man. He told his roommate he'd be back later that night, but he never returned. The next day when he didn't show up for a family Christmas breakfast, fear began to arise. The search for Kevin started on December 26. On December 27, Kevin's car was found in a parking lot in Clayton Township. His phone was there, still logged into all the apps, and the police could trace his final messages to Wilk Alikos Vilkas. If they had known his real name, they would have found numerous police reports on him because he was actually Mark Latunsky. So who was Mark Latunsky? Also known as Wilk Alikos Vilkas on social media. Born in 1969, a native Michigander, he had a long history of mental health issues. He was diagnosed with chronic major depression, psychotic features, adjustment disorder with depression anxiety, paranoid schizophrenia, and borderline personality traits. He was highly intelligent, attended Central Michigan University and Iowa State University, and he was a chemist by profession. He was married twice, once to a woman named Emily, with whom he had four kids, and later to a man named Jamie Arnold. They met on Grindr, and initially things were great, but the relationship deteriorated due to Mark's refusal to take his meds and his involvement in the BDSM lifestyle. Mark Latunsky wasn't new to this kind of behavior. He had lured men to his home on West Harrell Road, Bennington Township, before Kevin Bacon disappeared. There were two incidents, one in October 2018 and another in 2019, where men ran from his house calling 911. These earlier incidents, while not resulting in fatalities, were harrowing encounters that foreshadowed his capability for more heinous crimes. In October 2018, nearly two and a half months before Kevin Bacon's disappearance, a 48-year-old man named James Carlson experienced a terrifying ordeal at the hands of Latunsky. Carlson traveled from New York to Michigan, specifically for an encounter arranged through social media to have him interact with Mark, found himself in a perilous situation. After falling asleep in Latunsky's car, he awoke to find himself tied up in Latunsky's basement. Carlson managed to escape by cutting the straps with a butcher knife, an item alarmingly out of place in such a setting. He fled the house and called 911, but shockingly, no charges were pressed against Latunsky, and the incident was seemingly dismissed. The pattern of alarming behavior continued when, six weeks later, on November 25, 2019, a similar incident occurred. This time, a 29-year-old man managed to escape from Lutunsky's house and called 911 while fleeing. The victim was found wearing nothing but a leather kilt and reported that Lutunsky had chased him. He sought refuge at a neighbor's house, pleading for help and protection from Lutunsky. Again, when police arrived, Lutunsky managed to convince them that the encounter was consensual and part of a social role-play, leading to no legal action being taken. This lack of police intervention after two such alarming incidents highlighted a concerning oversight and possibly a prejudice response due to the nature of the encounters. In both the instances, nothing significant happened legally. These events were later criticized, as it seemed the police didn't take the case seriously, possibly due to the victims being gay men involved in some activities. These previous instances were not only early warning signs of Mark Lutunsky's dangerous behavior, but also a stark reminder of the potential consequences of unchecked mental health issues and the importance of thorough police investigations. Lutunsky's ability to repeatedly convince authorities of the innocuous nature of these events, despite their clear danger, raises serious questions about their response to such situations, especially in the context of unconventional lifestyles. The police's failure to act on these earlier events ultimately paved the way for the tragic fate of Kevin Bacon and left a community grappling with the aftermath of these overlooked warnings. The police later tracked missing Kevin to Mark's home through messages on Kevin's phone. Arriving there on December 27, Mark initially introduced himself with a different name, but eventually let the police in, and they made a horrifying discovery. In the basement, Kevin Bacon was found chained to the rafters by his ankles, completely naked and deceased. Mark had stabbed Kevin in the back, slit his throat, and committed gruesome acts of mutilation. He was later arrested and charged with Kevin Bacon's murder and the mutilation of a dead body. As Mark's trial began, new information began to surface about his past. His history showed a list of grievances regarding his mental health. 
Mark was known to stop taking the medication prescribed to treat his mental health illnesses. According to the records from the 66th District and the 35th Circuit Courts, a motion filed August 22 by former wife Emily Latunsky to suspend Mark's Latunsky's parental custody states that he was diagnosed with major depression, paranoid schizophrenia, and traits of a personality disorder back in 2010 and 2012. It was also revealed through Freedom of Information Act requests that police were called to Mark's home for 10 incidents in which Mark was involved, dating back to 2013. Twice in February, 2020, Mark had to be taken to the local hospital from the Shiawassee County Jail because of apparent medical issues. A Michigan State Police trooper was dispatched February 18 through the Shiawassee County Jail after Mark was found unresponsive in his cell. Police said, Shiawassee County District Judge Ward Clarkson ruled on October 5, 2020 that Mark was mentally fit to stand trial. Mark's attorney suggested this wasn't a murder case and even requested the court consider it an assisted suicide, but the court declined. Toxicology reports showed antidepressants in Kevin's bloodstream. However, text messages between the two showed that Kevin Bacon had wanted Mark Latunsky to ensure his safety after their encounter. Despite his claims, Mark was charged with the murder and mutilation of Kevin Bacon. He initially pleaded insanity, claiming that Kevin had asked him to end his life, which led to him stabbing Kevin in the spine and later slitting his throat. A police system was used to hang Kevin by his ankles in a grotesque act that Mark claimed was to expedite Kevin's death. Mark Latunsky's trial was mired in complexity. His attorney, Doug Corrin, argued that this was not a straightforward murder case, suggesting assisted suicide as a possible angle. However, the court disagreed, yet Mark's public defender, Doug, indicated that Latunsky was assisting Bacon in suicide, pointing to the antidepressants found in Bacon's bloodstream. The narrative took a turn when messages revealed Kevin's concerns for his safety, contradicting Latunsky's account. Mark initially claiming to be assisting him with suicide, but the evidence suggested otherwise. The case continued to unravel as more details emerged. In September 2022, as the trial was gearing up, Mark Latunsky against his attorney's advice pled guilty to all charges, including the murder and mutilation of Kevin Bacon. He admitted to using a knife to stab Kevin and later removing and frying Kevin's genitals in a frying pan. The court found him guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. Despite his attorney's belief in the potential for a successful trial, Mark's guilty plea led to a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In January 2020, hundreds of people gathered in Kevin's honor outside Swartz Creek High School in his memory. This tragic case ends Mark Latunsky's reign of terror, but it also highlights a complete failure by the police. This negligence allowed Latunsky to continue his predatory acts, leading to Kevin Bacon's horrific end. It's a grim reminder of the importance of taking every report seriously, regardless of the circumstances.